folks welcome back to earth sky and today we have a pretty cool mystery for you to explore with us we're going into the high sierra of california and in, in uh, north america and we're going to look at what could be the highest growing tree at least in california and it's an interesting story uh dr hugh staff there's no key <laughs> up altitude Mount Kauia, and he found something that shouldn't be there. Hugh, you found a tree that was in a mystery place. It shouldn't be there. Tell us about it. Which tree is it, first of all? In the middle. And it is, this, okay. this photo is taken at about 11,800 feet, and this is right. about where you pop out of the, you know, what you'd call continuous forest at that point. And um, being an ecologist who works a lot in high elevation forests, I know what Jeffrey Pine looks like. I work with it a lot, and I know it doesn't belong at 11,800 feet. And that's the strange critter you're seeing right there in the middle of the photo. Okay, so the middle tree is a Jeffrey Pine, and previously it had no business above the tree line, which I assume was where about where we are. We're, we're in a, a montane environment on the side of a steep hill, yes? Yeah, yeah. So it, what, what it is, there's sort of two words that, well, there are a lot of words we use to describe how yeah, the, yeah, how, how, how forests, uh, how, they, yeah. how they're structured at high elevation. We usually use the word like timberline to represent sort of where continuous forest ends. Oh. And then tree line is often where you run out of trees. Now, mind you, different researchers use uh, slightly different terminology, but I'll yeah. use that in this, in this presentation. Okay. So what makes this remarkable is that it's at a newly discovered height. And how did you feel about it when you saw the thing there? I mean, you just, I assume you just wandered up and there it was, or there they were. <laughs> yeah, more this, than this was not a science expedition. My wife and I like to do long distance hiking and we had seven or eight days and decided we were going to do the High Sierra Trail because I've seen the beginning of it and the end of it. And everyone who's walked it has told me it is one of the best trails in the world. And so we got on it and on our, you know, maybe our fourth day, we, we did it backwards from Whitney going west. And okay. uh, I hadn't climbed Mount Coea and, um, uh, a little bit hyperactive when it comes to wanting to climb mountains when I'm sitting at their base. And so one morning I took off at 6, 6 a.m., told my wife to be back at, you know, I don't know what, 10 or 11. Yeah. And uh, started marching up this thing. And I'm walking through or s s sort of slogging steeply through a forest of foxtail pine and lodgepole pine, which is what you'd mm -hmm. expect at that elevation. Right. And then I pop out there at 11,800 to get a drink and look out over the amazing scene that you get once you get out of the forest there. And there was that Jeffrey Pine. And um, I was gobsmacked. I mean, I, I uh, hadn't seen a Jeffrey Pine for quite a while uh, as I walked up through the forest. I mean, the nearest one I'd seen was probably two and a half, three miles away and certainly 2,000 feet lower, an adult tree. And uh, so my uh, climb up the mountain turned into a science expedition, basically, because I saw another dozen of them right there. And I started thinking, well, if I'm going to climb this mountain, I'm going to see how far this Jeffrey Pine goes, because I already can't believe what I'm seeing. So uh, you, did you immediately know why it was up there? Uh, well, yeah, so so Jeffrey Pine has a very big seed. Uh, and okay. there are, and, and so it was real clear to me, uh, given what I'd seen, mind you, I hadn't like, you know, census the entire forest there. But given that the nearest Jeffrey Pine was as far away as I'd seen, and given that I know that Jeffrey Pine doesn't grow at this elevation, um, <laughs> it had to be dispersed long distance. And that basically lands at the foot of a bird of some kind. And the the, the bird that really moves, yeah, there you go, Clark's nut. There he is. Um, and, and that's got to be the culprit. I mean, you know, we will spend some time uh, doing this a little more scientifically to be sure that it's not, you know, a type of jay or something else moving it. But... Uh, it's got to be Clark's Nutcracker based on everything we saw and all the people that we've talked to. And we saw plenty of Clark's Nutcrackers flying around in the forest up there. As a fan um, of corvids, is that a corvid? It sure looks it like one. It yeah, is. That's what it's I thought. A very smart bird. And it a is. single bird, it's, it seems impossible, but a single bird like that can cache anywhere from 10 to 30,000 seeds, uh, <laughs> you know, during the period of seed maturation. And they just scattered them all over the landscape so they can go find that food when they need it in the winter and the early spring. But they don't intend for those seeds to grow. Those seeds are supposed no, to be No, that's a failed cache if it grows. <laughs> okay, and so, that thing. so they're growing in a space they weren't growing. That was safe storage before, but it's not now. What's going on there? I mean, how that's right. I mean, it's essentially cold growing. storage, right? It's really what it is. So, right. so yeah, I mean, they're, they're searching for places. I mean, who knows exactly what's going on in a Clark's Nutcracker's brain? I certainly don't. There are bird biologists who have a much better idea. Um, 
but yeah. it, you know, it's, it's, it's evolution has been to evolve with a suite of uh, Western conifers that generate big, you know, the big one is white bark pine because it has a mm. huge seed and it doesn't really have a wing on the seed. So it's easy, no. uh, big caloric payoff. Uh, Jeffrey pines a little smaller than the white bark pine and it has a sea, uh, wing on it. So, you know, it's a moment to choke down. Um, but they grab these seeds and they move them around the landscape and they, they, they sort of plant them. They use their bill, they shove their bill down into the ground. And so it gets, it gets a little bit of soil above it. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, the typical caching location in elevations like this, I've been told by those people who know these sorts of things that it's really common for them to particularly hit south slopes where you have a little bit of soil and it's often done in sort of rocky enclosures. Um, yeah exactly why that relates to where it, uh, uh, Clark's Nutcracker would cache. Uh, I think it's probably because that's going to be protected from too much uh, uh, snow and probably is going, that's going to be one of the first places on a high mountain to open up in the late winter. On the early south spring. Yeah. On a south facing elevation, that's going to yeah. catch, that's going to catch the first spring sun. That that's reminds right. me of the, we have the scrub jays down here doing exactly the same thing with the oak uh, acorns. Anyway. Right. So, right. Specifically, right. what's the mechanism here? I assume the bird eats the seed, the seed survives the digestive system, or it's being hammered into the ground, like you described. Are there two mechanisms here? or Yeah, they don't. When they're caching, I mean, certainly they're eating some small portion of what they're caching, but no, they have a pouch in here, and they can hold a crazy number of seeds. I'm not going to give you a wow. number, but when you look it up, you won't believe how high it is, because I, I, I'll get it wrong. But it's insane how many okay. seeds they can fly around with. And then they just, they don't swallow them and they just basically get the, in their beak and their beak is like a little hammer, like a, a, a drill seed or just boot into the soil. And they'll <laughs> usually cash a bunch of them. So this is why if, if your listeners know white bark pine, for example, if you see a white bark mm -hmm. pine, one of the easiest ways to quickly identify it, uh, limber pine is similar in this respect, is it's, it looks like it's a shrub because it'll have five or six or seven stems coming out of the ground at the same place. But those mm -hmm. aren't the same tree. Those are all different germinants from different seeds that were cast there by a Clark's nutcracker. So, okay. Yeah. So this was one of the things I was told to look for by the bird biologists when we were looking at the Jeffrey pine was, you know, are they occurring in clumps rather than just single trees? And the answer was they were, uh -huh. although Jeffrey pine isn't nearly as adapted to these really high cold elevations, like say a white bark pine would be or a limber exactly. pine or a foxtail pine. So Especially not, 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 you know, you're not going to see full germination of an entire cache. You, you're going to be lucky to get a couple of seeds that come out. Right? So yeah, we describe this as a species creep. As, is that a correct term to use here? And well, you know, yeah, well, yeah, I think in this case, actually, no, <laughs> I think, I think that, but, 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 but what I want to make clear is that that idea of a species sort of creeping uphill is, is the general model that most people have in their minds when they think about the way that climate right. warming is going to influence uh, where forests are on high mountains. And that is that as the climate warms, there'll be this slow uphill migration. And migration is the proper word. It's just that plants migrate at a very, very different scale than animals do and, and pace. <laughs> but the point here is that rather than just seeing foxtail and lodgepole pine slowly moving uphill, which is definitely happening as well, no question about it. Um, right. you, you do see seedlings of them higher all the time. Jeffrey that Pine was, was, flown, was flown over the top of them uh, by a bird. So it wasn't a creep. It was a big, it was a leap for a tree kind. Jump. You know what I mean? Just jumped <laughs> over all these other guys, went 2,000 feet uphill. And it's probably been getting deposited there by Clark's Nutcracker for millennia. But right. at this point, it's starting to get warm enough that some of those uh, seeds put in cold storage are actually able to germinate and survive through enough years to get to become, you know, a small tree. Now, I, I, I will say this, that none of the trees I saw uh, and I measured, like, I think it was 14 of them, and I saw another dozen at least. None of them had cones, even though mm. some of them were at least 20 to 25 years old at the lower end down by the, you know, where the dense forest was. So these trees are not enjoying their time there. <laughs> it's, it's a harsh place to be, but they can deal mm -hmm. with the cold now, those ones. Uh, and, you know, drought is going to be a much bigger issue at high elevation in the Sierra. Typically, we think of high elevation forests as being driven by winter cold. You know, that's the filter. You yeah. can make it through that, you're going to live. But it's so dry uh, in the Sierra already. And now that it's getting so much warmer, it's that much drier. And so a species like Jeffrey pine is pretty uniquely adapted to that because it is much more drought tolerant than any of those other pines that are, uh -huh. or, or species at that elevation. Yeah, that is one of the things that's affecting 
the forest. If I didn't make it clear, I am in Visalia, California right now, which means okay. that these pine trees are about 35 miles east of me. And this yeah. is my backyard. I grew up, I, I worked at the Lodge Bowl Market. I worked at Cedar Grove, okay, which are local. Only locals would know this, so I'm sorry to Very confuse cool. anybody who's watching. But what's this going to do to our environment here, to our, our Sierra? How is it going to change over the long term? Is this indicative of something coming? Or what do you see happening here, Hugh? Tell me about that. Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, the the worry that everyone has about climate warming in, mm -hmm. in mountains is that mountains get smaller as you go uphill, and as species are forced to move up to stay within sort of you know the envelope of their climatic tolerances, at some point they're going to run out of space to be on anymore. And this wow. is a big problem for species right at the top of mountains, uh, particularly in lower mountains. Like for example, I've done a lot of work in South America, and in Brazil there are mountains up to about 94, 9,500 feet that are just absolutely chock full of species found nowhere else on the planet. And there isn't anywhere to go. Once that, once that climate pushes them off the top, you're going to have to keep them alive in botanical gardens, or I don't know where you're going to keep them alive. The Sierra, so Southern Sierra is much higher. There's a lot more ground there, right? Yes. But not, not a whole lot of soil up high. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, you know, there's going to be this sort of push and pull of climate pushing everything uphill, but whether or not, it, you know, in the past it was cold. Cold is not going to be as much of a filter anymore as it was. Uh, and it's probably going to be more like drought. And what I think, if I were to try to project forward what might happen in this place, because, you know, a lot yeah. of other things could happen, um, is that right now Jeffrey Pine is being moved uh, by, let's say, Clark's Nutcracker, thousands of feet uphill and many, many miles horizontally. Uh, and now some of those seeds are germinating. And so you have, it's like sort of Gilligan's Island. These poor things are stranded up there above the, the timberline in this inhospitable environment. And they're not able to make codes yet. And the tops of most of the big ones are, are dead because when they stick out of the snow, I think they freeze and they get blasted by snow blast and all this. But that window is clearly moving uphill because as I climb that mountain, I mean, I found the highest seedling. It was almost 12,700 feet, which is just unbelievable. That's higher than any recorded tree in any formal database in California. For a Jeffrey Pine, that makes absolutely no sense. But uh, at some point, it's going to get warm enough for those trees, uh, you know, at the timberline to start growing cones. And then I would project, predict that you're going to see an explosion of Jeffrey Pine all of a sudden because you'll have, you know, seeds right there that are able to, 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 you know, to generate a bigger forest. And so, you know, this is decades, I'll probably going on by the time this all plays yeah. out. But but anyway, that would be, at least that's one scenario. What, what, what could sure. Happen. I have one more concern. What okay. about the giant sequoias? Is What's the environment change going to do to them? I mean, they've been around for millennia. I think they could probably handle it, but I don't know. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, giant sequoias in their native habitat have a pretty, there's a pretty well-defined set of environmental parameters in terms of uh, climatic parameters. Uh, you know, they're typically, not always, but often in north-facing pockets of relatively deep soil, you know, sort of at those middle elevations, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of that left in the Southern Sierra that isn't already occupied by them. So I think that in terms of moving uphill easily for a species that generates that kind of biomass, I mean, it needs it needs access to some soil and some resources. Mm -hmm. Tough to say. I mean, there are people a much better place than I am to make those sorts of predictions. Yeah. I will say this. I don't think, you know, some species are just like, wow, they're so rare and, and we're really worried about keeping that genetic information around for the long haul. You know, giant sequoia has been planted everywhere. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I was in Croatia a couple years ago. Oh, giant sequoias in the botanical garden here. And I, I you know, in Algeria, they have giant sequoias. I was working with an Algerian botany group uh, a couple years ago. They have their giant sequoias are all dying because they're getting hit by oh, a fungus no. and they were really distraught about it. And then you realize every, every single country in the world has populations of giant sequoia. And I worked for the Forest Service for decades. And our foresters, I mean, they might still do this, but they used to just plant whatever they wanted, you know, and they were planting uh -huh. giant sequoias everywhere. So there are forests of giant sequoia along, you know, Highway 50 going up to Lake Tahoe, for example. So I, well, you yeah, know, anyway, I don't, yeah. mean to, I don't mean to belittle the because it is under huge threat. Yeah. I mean, drought is killing them now. There, there's some insects that we were not uh, mm -hmm. mortal uh, uh, agents before, but seem to be now. Uh, obviously, we, we're starting to kill giant sequoias in fires, which seems is something that kind of blew my mind. So it's something yeah. to be worried about. It is. Hugh, this is, has been an excellent really informative talk i am so glad you could join us and tell us about the jeffrey pine and 
it's travels up the mountain up to the I, I guess we could call it a sky island couldn't we yes an island yeah. of, of biological unique species thanks again Hugh and thank you everybody who's been watching remember to give us a like and a subscribe remember folks it's one earth one sky earth sky thank you so much for being here everybody <laughs>